Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Homer Gonzalez. I'm the communications coordinator here at Waterloo Greenway, and we're so excited to give you all a behind the scenes look at the latest construction progress at Waterloo Park. Please feel free to use the chat or Q&A feature throughout the tour to ask questions. This webinar is being recorded and I'll be sending out a link afterwards so you all can share with your networks. It'll also be available on YouTube, our social media channels, and at waterloogreenway.org. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Today's virtual tour will be presented by our CEO, Peter Mullen. You can switch over to the next slide. Also joining us uh, for the Q&A portion is our Director of Planning and Design, John Rigdon. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to y'all, Peter. Thanks. Great, thank you, uh, Homer. Sorry, a little slow on the on the on the video there for a second. Um, for some reason, my there we go. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So thank you all for joining and taking time out of your day. Um, I know that particularly these days, uh, following the events of last week, everybody's a little uh, a little. Um, uh, stressed, so really appreciate your participation and uh, engagement even that much more. And um, so really thank you for being here. Um, uh, I wanna just, before I get into Waterloo Park, just give you a little bit of an overview of the project just as context, because I think it's always important um, to set that stage. Um, you know, our overall project at Waterloo Greenway is this green strip on the east side of downtown and uh, being downtown and being in the center of, of Austin um, is really meaningful and important to us because our, our aspiration is that this is, will be a place that will serve the entire city. Um, and so being in the center of the city um, is really representative of our, of our mission and, and that aspiration. Um, our goal is to create a new public space and park system on the east side of downtown that becomes the, the ordering mechanism, let's say the, the spine and the, the framework for an evolving city in an evolving Austin. We're in this incredible period of, of urbanization. Um, nothing, not even a pandemic can seem to, to slow that down. And um, so we need to figure out how to do that in a way that is uh, sustainable, both environmentally and socially and also uh, keeps us close to our roots and our values. And that's really what this project is about. How do we um, create a place that serves the entire community and therefore is a basis of, of um, a new uh, urban environment where the public realm really comes first um, and is the, is the thing that, that defines the city and defines the growth of the city going forward. Um, you know, the pillars of our project are really based around three things. Um, ecology and restoring the ecology of Waller Creek that runs at the spine of the project. Um, at the heart of it, this is about providing um, a place of nature in the middle of the city and providing people with access to that place of nature. We've seen in the past year during the pandemic how important those moments of connecting with nature are um, to our mental health and well being. Uh, the second pillar is really about mobility and connectivity, uh, creating a new uh, pedestrian and cycling trail along uh, Waller Creek uh, through the park system that we're creating, Waterloo Greenway, um, connecting the university to the lake and eventually and actually to South Austin, but really tying into this broader urban trail network that's um, evolving and growing in our city um, through a number of different partners, uh, the Trail Foundation, Soul Creek Conservancy, of the Hill Country Conservancy. There are lots of, of entities that are all coming together to build an alternative mobility network in our city so that Austin becomes um, more connected, more pedestrian friendly, more human centered. Um, and that's what Waterloo Greenway is, is, is a big part of what that, this project is. And then the third are the parks themselves, these, these destinations along this green spine, um, each of which has its own specific character and function uh, but the the sum of which really add up into this very diverse um, tapestry of experiences um, that can serve a, a broad public, a diverse public, um, broadly at different times of day, different times of year, et cetera. And Waterloo Park is really the first part of that. And 
the beauty of parks, and I think we've also seen this during the pandemic, is that they can serve the public in so many different ways. Um, I get a little choked up when I see this image because um, I don't know about you all, but I'm longing for the time when we can do this again and get back together in, in groups of people and have a shared experience with our fellow Austinites. Um, but the parks are also important places for, for solitary moments, quiet moments uh, of community with nature um, and kind of everything in between. I think the beauty of park spaces, generally speaking, is that the public can make them their own. And I think that's certainly true about Waterloo Park and Waterloo Greenway. This is a platform for human experience, human expression, um, the likes of which we will not be able to predict. It's, it's sort of infinitely expandable. Um, there's infinite opportunity. And so everything that we do with the design is about how do we facilitate um, that open-endedness about this place um, so that it can really fulfill all of our aspirations and dreams and possibilities. Um, so getting to it. First phase um, of the larger project is Waterloo Park, the northern end. It's the largest park in our overall project, 11 acres. Um, it will be the largest park uh, downtown, north of the river, when we are completed. So a major urban park destination for Austin. Um, and I hope this will become self-evident as I go through the images. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we're excited to start here as our first phase is because it has all of those aspects of the project that I talked about just now embedded in it. Um, there are, there's over a mile of, of hike and bike trails. Um, there are places for big events, but there are also places for quieter uh, moments and communing with nature. And so right out of the gate, we can show the public um, what this project is all about and what it will promise as the future phases unfold. Um, so this is the, the big idea is to create a new, uh, a new center, a new destination, a kind of living room for downtown and for all of Austin um, in the heart of the city, um, right adjacent to the Capitol um, and doing it. It's a place that is activated uh, all the time um, during the day, but also in the evenings and, and throughout the year. So this is a place that is constantly enlivened by the people and the, and the activities that happen within it. Um, made a lot of progress on construction. Uh, this is a little over a year ago. You can see it was still pretty much um, in the dirt. Um, and this was from this fall, right? So you can see um, the, the park kind of largely built out, uh, the cantilever lawn stretching out over the creek. You can see the creek is flowing here um, down in sort of the bottom left corner of the, of, the, of the screen with the inlet facility of the tunnel behind, and then the, the canopy of the moving, Moody Amphitheater um, in the shadow of the Capitol and really the kind of signature iconic um, piece of architecture to define the place. Um, this is uh, the park last week, um, and I've got some more images of it in the snow. Um, we're lucky that we, we really suffered very little damage um, during the storm. I know that this is, you know, obviously it was a, a point of incredible stress for many, many people, um, uh, but there is a kind of uh, extraordinary beauty to the park during the snow. And I think it's, it's just indicative of how the park can function at, at different times of year um, in different ways. So let's go, let's, uh, let's, let's go. Um, I'll take you through the park. Uh, so this is an image of the great lawn of the Moody Amphitheater. And you can see how the, the structure of the amphitheater is it's kind of floating steel and glass um, sculpture in the landscape. Um, and then there's underneath that is this, uh, this sort of meandering curving wall, uh, a concrete wall that's really of the ground and holds all of the functionality that makes the, the, the amphitheater work and turns it into a really a fully functional um, performing arts venue for Austin. And the first really permanent uh, performing arts, outdoor performing arts venue of this scale um, in the city. And I think will enable us to do a whole host of different events of different kinds throughout the year. Um, you can see on the left, those big gray doors, those are windows for concessions. So during an event, we'll be able to serve food and beverage to the public. Um, we also have, um, uh, so we have concessions on both sides of the stage. You can see them in the distance there as well, um, as well as our public restrooms on both sides of the stage as well. And then the, 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 the canopy is really uh, meant to evoke uh, the kind of the tree canopy 
um, when I say the canopy, the canopy over the stage, that's what we call it, um, is really meant to evoke the, the tree canopy kind of meandering through the site. And I'll show you some more images of that. Um, yeah, here's a view kind of straight on with the Capitol behind. You can see the stage. Um, and you can see how the 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 fact that the, the structure has a glass roof, it allows the light to flow through it and cast these incredible shadows on these curved walls behind. Um, you know, it really has that kind of dappled light effect that you get when you're under a large um, live oak tree, of which we have many on the site. Um, and this is a place that, you know, obviously, when it's not in the show, um, will be accessible to the public and uh, usable to the public as part of the park. And I think you can imagine, you know, this lawn doing, you know, having a whole host of different activities in it, um, depending on time of day and time of year. Uh, there you can see a side view of the stage um, with the stairs and ramp that give access to the public to the stage when, when it's not in performance. Um, this uh, uh, large trench drain, that's, this is this curved element at the foot of the stairs, um, is uh, actually accessed into a, a 50,000 gallon cistern. So all the runoff from the building and from the, the lawn go into the cistern that then gets stored and pumped and used for irrigation and then uh, feeds a series of rain gardens in the southern part of the site. Um, you'll get a sense how um, the the site is really all about, you know, the the sort of experience of the topography on the site, and we're we're adding to that with the creation of this building that's built into the hillside of the landscape. So you can see how you're up at this kind of terrace level, um, looking down onto the lawn. Um, this terrace level is really at the level of Trinity Street, and so this will all be. Uh, accessible to the public as well. Um, here's a, another view of that terrace with the canopy um, extending out over it. And you can see how the canopy starts to change uh, as you move around the site and the perception of the scale of the structure changes. It's, you know, when you get up higher and you're on this roof terrace or you're looking at it from Trinity Street, um, you you have, it's a much more intimate uh, piece of architecture. And I think uh, you'll be, get to see the level of detail with all these individual beams and um, really appreciate the intricacy of the structure as it floats on these very slender, small columns. Um, there's another shot you can see looking to the west, I'm sorry, to the east. Um, and you get a little bit of a sense of how the light comes through and how you can see the sky up through it. A um, few little tricks with the design, uh, you know, the glass that's on, that's embedded in the structure uh, only extends out over a, a little bit past the stage. So when you get to the, the edge of the of the steel structure, um, it, it, the, there is no glass, and so it's really transparent. And so the whole it, it kind of tricks you into thinking that the whole structure is is open that way, um, even though we are providing that weather protection over the stage. So a little bit of a sleight of hand there. Um, the Part of the roof of the building on these is, is occupiable terraces, but a lot of it is occupied by green roofs. Um, and we have a series of really beautiful plantings. This is, you know, during the storm, these are some of the plantings that took the hardest hit, you know, some of the agaves and the cacti. Um, so we've had to trim those back um, this week, but um, it really this kind of very lush and obviously uh, regionally specific uh, landscape on this roof terrace. And so you really get the sense that the structure is kind of basically a landscape um, that you can occupy at different levels um, that's partly planted, partly uh, terraced. And then on the lower level, there are a series of uh, strips that are with that are planted with vines. So the, the concrete walls will have kind of green um, vines growing up them. It's a, a two types of vines, a fig ivy and a, a Virginia creeper. And um, so a lot of the, this building will be really um, hidden by this this vine cover um, and really just again feel like part of the landscape and then you can see on the right um, the stairs going up to, from the the lawn level up to the terrace level um, and we have an elevator also that's usable by the public to make to make sure that all of this is accessible um, to um, people of all abilities and then looking down trinity street so this is looking north and you can see the uh, the football stadium, UT football stadium in the background. Um, and the, you can get a sense again, how this structure is really built into the landscape. You know, there's a lot of this very steep hill on Trinity Street um, going downhill to the north. And you can see how these steps um, lead off the sidewalk onto a plaza 
um, on the roof terrace. Um, oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, there you see it again. So all of this now has really been completed. The terrace is complete. You can see those are roof pavers and those concrete steps that kind of feather into the, the sidewalk. Whole new sidewalk um, built along the city's great street standards with street trees and uh, benches and bike racks, et cetera. Um, and there you get a sense of the lighting and how that's embedded into the structure. I'll show you some more pictures of the lighting in a little bit. That's that's now been really built out and I think provides a sense of what the nighttime experience will be here as well. Uh, and then looking at the structure back um, from the north, looking south, looking uphill. And this is, I like this image because you get a really great sense of how the light plays with the structure um, and reflects off of all these individual beams. Um, it provides this kind of really almost vibrating quality to the structure. Um, and then one of the things that's happened recently is that we have planted, uh, we have a really robust planting strip between the sidewalk and the wall of the amphitheater. And so, again, you get this very, the, the, the purpose, the, the, the sort of mantra throughout is landscape first. This is a, how do we perceive this, this park as a landscape that has this structure kind of embedded and integrated into it. And so this um, this very lush uh, planted edge will help uh, to do that and achieve that. Okay, so that's all about the amphitheater, which you can see on the on the north side of the site um, in the background of this image. And that's you know that's one part of the experience of Waterloo Park, but um, there's so much more as well. Uh, you know, the southern half of the of the park is really you know all about. Um, uh, providing a whole different diverse array of park experiences, ranging from sort of more active to more passive. And you move to the south, and when you get to the southern end where we're stand, where we're hovering, um, it's really about creating an immersive experience of nature uh, with a series of paths that wind through what we call the hill country garden um, and provide that allow the public to really get lost in the landscape. It's a, sort of like bringing a piece of the hill country into the middle of the city. Um, which I think, you know, particularly for people that may not have the opportunity to get out into the hill country that often, um, is a great opportunity for, you know, this growing urban population. Um, you know, we've, the, the design is all oriented to figure out how to create the most immersive natural experience possible. Um, you know, really intensive uh, uh, local plantings, 95% of the, of the plantings are, are all local and indigenous, um, but really packing it in. And I, you know, one of the things that's important to note is that um, this project really is a, is a, participates in the kind of the long history of landscape design and garden design, um, where landscapes are not just uh, a piece of nature that's kind of framed, but they're really an, a, a designed piece of nature. Because obviously, particularly when you're in urban areas and you don't have the kind of the scale and the space to really to um, replicate some of the effects that you have in nature. It's all about using design to um, sort of condense them and compress them to give that experience in that smaller area. And so there's a lot of, we're doing a lot of that on the site um, and this kind of intensified planting regime that we put in, while again, specific, is, is not what you would necessarily see in the natural realm, but it will give you the experience of being in nature in this kind of intensified um, designed way. Um, we have a, 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 a this limestone scramble path that meanders through the through the hill country garden um, and provides, I think, particularly when when the, the landscape grows in, fills in, um, for kids in particular, a chance to really get lost in this landscape and feel like it's something that they can explore and discover. Um, and to give a sense of mystery about the landscape to it. So really excited to see how uh, this grows in. You know, the, the joke about architecture is that, you know, architecture look best the day it's, uh, you know, the, the building's complete. Landscapes look the worst, right? They only get better over time. Um, and so we'll be excited to see how this landscape grows in as, as it matures and uh, evolves. Um, so as I said, we have a series of paths that, uh, cut their way and carve their way through the landscape. Um, one of those is this really exciting elevated walkway, the Suzanne Deal Booth um, Skywalk. Um, you know, because of the intense slope of the site, we had to create this um, sort of elongated path 
to provide a, a easy and gentle ramp down um, into the park. It's actually not even a ramp, it's just a slow path, less than 5% grade. So incredibly gentle um, and easy for people of all abilities to get down into the park. But it also provides this really a series of, of extraordinary visual effects and experiential effects when you are at different elevations relative to the landscape around you. Um, you start out on the ground, then you end up floating in the air, and then you come back to the ground as the ground rises up to you. Um, and at all those different elevations, you have a different experience. Um, this is a view looking from the uh, north, looking south. Um, and then as it comes down, it also creates a series of spaces. So on the left, you have the Lebanon Plaza, which is kind of a mini amphitheater seating for a couple hundred people. Um, as opposed to 5,000 in the Moody Amphitheater. So we can do programs and events of different scales and sizes. Um, this is also, I think, a great place for street performers. Um, if you're, a, if you're a, you know, a, an amateur fire breather or, or mime, really want to invite you to come down and, and show your stuff in Waterloo Park. Um, I think you'll get a, a great audience, and uh, we want to have all that kind of activity. Um, that's, you can see the a view of the of the skywalk back in the fall. And so with the landscape kind of under construction, um, and then that's what it looks like now uh, with the landscape planted out. Um, again, it's really rich, beautiful, lush um, landscape that that I think is uh, gonna, it, it feels so much bigger than it is in the context of the city. And I think is one of the great surprises of of experiencing the park that, Frankly, it was a surprise, you know, to all of us that were involved because, um, you know, it, things are never, you have imagined what they're going to be. And then when they get built out, they're, they're always a little bit different. And one of the things about this landscape is that it feels much bigger than I expected. And I think that's true for most people. Um, as the, the walkway moves down, you kind of move into the center of the site where we have this concentration of amenities. Um, there's a, uh, a series of play structures that are built into the landscape. Um, there's a, a, the stone slide on the left with a series of stone scrambles on either side of it. Um, and then uh, play structures for, for um, so different kids of different ages on the right. We have a climber that's for older kids and then this mega grass for toddlers to feel, you know, kind of um, in an enchanted in, you know, forest as they get miniaturized in, in um, comparison. Um, there's another shot. The, the area all around it is, has been planted with turf, so um, really family friendly. Um, and this is right at the hub at the center of the park. So everybody coming into the park kind of ends up here. And I think this will be a, a real hive of activity and really um, fun um, place to be. Uh, adjacent to that, we have our public restroom and also um, some food amenities. We have hookups for two food trailers in this area. So um, you know, and this is an incredible, beautiful building, minimal building designed by Michael Shue's office. Um, you can see with the DG uh, uh, landscape around it. So again, different textures at different places in the park to give you a different feel and to create this sense of um, each of these spaces is its own little room, um, even as it's connected to the other places in the park. And I think there's a really great flow between these different spaces. You can see the skywalk in the background of this image with the play structures just off to your left. Um, uh, I should say, I forgot to mention the, the, the play area is, uh, is named after Kitty King Powell, who was our first capital campaign donor. Um, and, uh, you know, and the Powell Foundation is one of the sponsors of today's program and has been an incredible supporter of us throughout. Um, the, the, the restroom building really is designed as, a, as almost like a, a, a grotto that's kind of built into the hillside. Um, and you can see at the back, there's a rendering showing how at the back of the, this breezeway, um, there are a series of vines um, that will grow up the, the back of the structure. And then we have um, some gender neutral uh, toilet facilities and a common wash basin in the middle. Um, and here you can see a picture of that recently under construction with the vines then planted. Um, and then the, the toilets on the left. And then we have a little bit of storage for programming support, et cetera, on the right. Um, and the details on this, I think, are just you know really, really beautiful. I mean, I got to give um, Michael and um, Maya and uh, Andrew and the entire team in that office for doing just an incredible job. This is this beautiful cast-in-place 
think structure uh, that was made by a local uh, fabricator here in Austin. Um, and this is just, again, taking this, this park down to a really beautiful level at the detail level. Um, and then the roof is kind of hovering over the walls with this clear story um, gap, which uh, allows light and ventilation to get into the, the toilet structures. And then adjacent to that, uh, so food service, public restroom, and the Kitty King Powell Lawn uh, is the Meredith Heritage Deck, which is this great wooden deck built under these two existing trees um, where we'll have flexible seating, tables, and chairs. So a place where a family can get a meal, um, uh, an affordable meal, and um, the kids can run and play, and the parents can relax, and uh, it's all kind of close together. Um, but the, but separate enough so the kids can have a little bit of freedom and, and um, you know, get into a little bit of trouble, not too much. And then you can see how it, you know, looking back um, towards the, towards the canopy of the amphitheater, how it's, you know, kind of nestled into the trees and really almost deferential to the trees on the site. Um, and it sort of demonstrates its kind of familial familiarity uh, with those elements. Um, okay, so then, uh, one of the other things that we've made a lot of progress on recently is the north end of the site. Um, this is the the basically looking. We're standing at 15th Street, looking south uh, towards the 14th Street Bridge. Um, the Bracket Ridge Hospital, which is the Del Seton Hospital garage, is on our left, and then the um, the Integral Care Building, former Ronald McDonald House, is on your right. Great Farron Granger Building, which I learned recently was their offices. Um, back in the day. So one of our great mid-century uh, local architects uh, both designed an, an office there. Um, and this is an area where we've piloted a number of different uh, techniques that we'll use um, in other areas of the creek in our sort of re restoration and creek reconstruction air efforts um, to the south. But one of the things that's great is that we can really um, now see how by opening up the creek, bending the slopes back, um, revegetating those slopes, so you can really, um, the creek experience will feel much more integrated into the public park experience. Um, it's not now that sort of hidden thing down there, right? It's It feels really part of um, the whole experience and at the center of that experience. And so being able to see the water, hear the water, um, and then to see how this grows in and with the different wildlife, um, really diverse uh, wildlife, I think is gonna be a really exciting thing to watch over the months and years to come. Um, and there you get again, sense of how this the slopes kind of have been bent back and, and opened up um, to allow sort of the view into the creek from the park. Um, I have a few images from, from the snow. These were all taken you know, before the worst of it last, last week. Um, the good news is, is that the, you know, we had very little damage to the trees in particular. You know, we moved a lot of trees around the site, so there was some concern about those in particular. And I expect all the three big trees you see here were moved as part of the project. Um, this is the big one that came from North Congress Avenue very at the very beginning of our construction progress. Um, but they seem to have fared very well. Um, no discernible damage to any of these trees. Um, and uh, so really good sign um, and also kudos to the whole, the design and construction teams for, for really great installation. Um, but I think just a little bit of a window of you know, how uh, these landscapes can look at different times of year and different conditions. Um, you know, one of the things about when it snows, which obviously doesn't happen very often here, but kind of reveals all the different uh, materiality differences in the park. Um, you know, and kind of highlights all of the different edges of those materials um, in a kind of really beautiful way. And you know, ironically, the you know the structure on the on the skywalk, which are these black sort of dark gray painted pillars, you know, they're designed to go away against the greenery of the landscape. But you know, on those few days where we do have snow, they really pop out and uh, just becomes a, a bit of a surprise and a, a new element in the landscape. And the the, the walk itself was really highlighted um, against the snow in the sort of serpentine form. Um, this is actually not an image from the storm. This is from that snowfall we had a few weeks ago, um, something that maybe is more common, we hope. 
than what we had last week. But even that, you know, it's just uh, uh, give provide some really beautiful textural uh, moments in the park. Um, one of the things that we've done a lot of, or the team has 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 done a lot of recently, is uh, finalized the lighting installation and, and testing. Um, and I think this is, you know, an aspect of the park that's really exciting. Um, the sort of the nighttime experience is just really shockingly beautiful. Um, this is a view of the stage. Um, this is from a few months ago, um, and this is a more recent image. So you can see how the, the as the lights have gotten installed, how the a little less contrasty. The lighting has gotten a little more evened out, but you still have this kind of glowing beacon of the stage. Um, one thing that we're actually exploring is the possibility of creating a video art in uh, in the park um, to highlight you know some of the, the nighttime experience. So excited about that. There'll be more on that coming later. Um, but obviously, seeing the the Capitol lit up in the background is just you know is really beautiful and, and it really frames that. Um, Beautifully, we have so there are light variety of different lighting types around the the park design. Um, some which um, illuminate the paths, so you know obviously safety is is priority number one. But doing that in a really elegant um, and beautiful way, um, you know, and then individual features also are are illuminated. Um, the the public restroom building in the area where the food trucks will be. Um, this is the path looking down towards uh, that structure. Um, and you can see how the light actually bounces back up and illuminates the underside of the structure, even though we're not actually pointing any lights at the, the skywalk underside, but it, it, it grabs the light and reflects it. Um, and then uh, the walkway itself is illuminated by a series of small point lights that are embedded into the handrail. Um, and so you can see how those kind of track the, the path of, of the walkway as it moves around. Um, and then the, the Leatherman Plaza in the middle um, is illuminated by these taller lights that give a much broader um, uh, spectrum or broader broader cone of light, I should say. Um, in addition, on the scramble path and in the landscape, we have these what we call firefly bollards, uh, which are these perforated tubes um, that provide a much an atmospheric light. They also light the the, the scramble path itself, um, and I think it's just a really um, you know, romantic element in the landscape. So um, looking forward to uh, date nights in the Hill Country Garden and, uh, you know, proposals and, um, you know, all the good stuff that can happen um, when when inspired. Um, the roof terrace on the amphitheater also lit, um, again, with this very subtle lighting, and you're always kind of aware of the, the stage canopy and the stage and kind of the, the glowy beacon in the background, but really beautiful with the, the um, the Capitol in the background, and then the the entry plaza off of Trinity Street, which is um, got a little more intense lighting because it's the main entrance into the park. Um, and then you can see how even at dusk, the the structure itself is like a giant light fixture and just grabs the light of the sunset, the fading light of the sunset. All those individual beams are picking up the light, and you get that incredible texture um, revealed. And then as it gets darker, um, the structure becomes this kind of glowing beacon in the landscape. Uh, we've also discovered how to use the structure um, and use lighting to really uh, uh, enliven the structure. So we weren't able to do Creek Show in its typical form this fall, um, but we did honor the uh, Creek Show by illuminating the, the Moody Amphitheater structure. And, um, you know, well, I want to give a shout out to the Word Company that designed this and, um, and actually produced a whole soundtrack to go along with it. Um, but I think what we discovered is that the structure is just, I mean, is, is meant to be lit. Um, and I think there's just lots of opportunities to do a really creative and exciting lighting, um, you know, as we go forward. Uh, one other piece of progress to point out as well is um, that the, uh, you know, the, the development um, of the city uh, around Waterloo Park, around Waterloo Greenway is also, um, picking up pace and coming together. So this building is um, on the first building of the new innovation district. So we're on the, the cantilevered walkway looking kind of Northeast. You can see the old Brackenridge Hospital in the background with the parking garage for the hospital on the left. Um, this will be a 20 story uh, office building uh, for research. Um, 
half of which will be, it's being really de uh, developed by the University of Texas Dell Medical School, um, as a, and half of it will be occupied by the medical school, school, half of it to be occupied by companies that really want to partner and collaborate with, with researchers at the medical school and the university. Um, and so this is modeled after places like Kendall Square um, in Cambridge, where MIT and companies are, you know, get together and do really exciting things. And so it's a perfect thing for Austin to tap into our, our entrepreneurial um, community, as well as the research assets we have at the university. Um, and so this is now out of the ground and growing, and I think will be done in 2022. Um, part of the project, this is a view looking north from basically from Symphony Square. Um, part of this, the scope of this project is actually relocate Red River Street from being adjacent to the park to being on the east side of the building. So look kind of continuing straight up through the city um, as opposed to curving around the edge of the park. And that what that will allow is the existing Red River to be pedestrianized um, as part of the park and trail experience of Waterloo Greenway as a whole. So really exciting to see this building coming to fruition. Um, and the city, as I said at the beginning, starting to respond to what we're doing at the park. Um, and these things, well, you know, this is not something that we control. It's something we uh, do a lot of coordination and collaboration with. And so you can start to see all these different parts and pieces of the urban soup, urban recipe coming together um, to create um, something really vibrant and exciting. Um, and then this, uh, you know, this is a recent image that, that was taken from a, um, you know, a recent drone flyover. And I just, I love it because it, it, it shows all the different kind of patterns um, and textures and um, ground cover types um, and how they're kind of all put together into this really intricate tapestry. You can see, you know, the Moody Amphitheater on the right, um, the Kitty King Power Lawn in the middle with that sort of DG. Um, it's actually not DG, it's a, it's a play surface, uh, engineer wood fiber, but it's got that light brown color in the middle. Um, the G, DG of the, uh, I say DG is decomposed granite, like you have on the Butler Trail, et cetera. Next to the public restrooms, that's that little building sort of carved into the, into the landscape, the little rectangular building. Um, and you see the, the, the Sandy Booth Skywalk curving around and then the scramble path, which is that light brown path that kind of goes up the hill. And, and, and you see how the, the detail of all of these different systems and how they're woven together um, to create this really rich um, natural experience. Um, again, providing a whole range of experiences in, in a relatively small and um, uh, contained urban setting. And I think the design team, um, you know, Michael Van Valkenburg and associates working with uh, DWG, uh, local landscape architects, you know, have just done an incredible job with the design. Um, and there is the a view um, of the park, a little more recognizable. Um, one last thing I just want to point out is that, you know, uh, don't look at the mayor and the city manager and the council members. I mean, we love them, obviously, but really this is to give a shout out to the staff of Waterloo Greenway um, because they're the real, um, uh, they're real heroes. I mean, all of these folks are working with incredible passion and dedication. Um, you know, we've had a lot of ups and downs in the last year, I mean, as, as many people have um, during the pandemic and now with the storm. Um, and they just, they, they, come to work every day with so much um, inspiration and talent and dedication. And I just, I'm, I feel so fortunate to be able to work with, with all these folks. So um, they really deserve a ton of, a, ton, a big shout out. Yeah, and then we'd love to take, take your questions. And again, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, really great overview of the entire park. Um, yeah, we, we had a, a couple of questions come in throughout the tour. Um, let's see here. Um, so Meg asked, what's the acreage of the Great Lawn area? Is it comparable to any existing park area in town? Yeah, so um, thanks, Homer, and, and thanks for the questions. I'm happy to help answer them. Um, so I don't know the exact acreage off the top of my head, but it's, I'd say it's around a couple of acres. and it is you know, larger than a city block. So I would say 
comparable to one of the downtown square parks, slightly bigger than that for the lawn space. Um, so maybe Republic Square um, is, you know, a comparable lawn, slightly bigger than than that park in terms of the size of that lawn alone. Yeah, and the and the capacity for the Great Lawn is five thousand, um, which is really exciting. Uh, I'm super excited to see shows at the at the Moody Amphitheater. Yeah, absolutely. Let me add. So five thousand would be the. Would, go ahead, Peter. No, no, no I was going to say, um, you know, one of the things that will be interesting to see is you know, the lower lawn, lower part of the lawn, you know, will have the option, and I think we'll use it a lot. Um, to install uh, actual chairs, temporary chairs, right? So the, the day of a show, we could bring out 3,000 chairs, deploy them on the lawn, um, you know, and so it'll be exciting to see how, how that changes the perception of that space, um, obviously, and also filled out with people. Sorry. No, that was great. Um, uh, somebody also asked um, if we have an expected completion date um, and so I can take this one. Um, right now, we don't have an exact date just yet, but our target is for spring 2021. And so I encourage all of you to, um, you know, sign up to our newsletter at waterloogreenway.org, um, and you'll be the first to know as soon as we have an update. Um, as soon as, you know, right now we're we're getting ready to plan our opening season, and so uh, we want to make sure, especially with COVID in mind, um, that we're we open the park um, and host all these events uh, with that in mind. And so, um, yeah, we're really excited. We also got a question about um, accessibility. Um, John, can you talk a little bit about ADA accessibility specifically at the Moody Amphitheater? Sure, absolutely. And, and just Starting more broadly, um, one of the goals for this park and the and the entire Greenway is universal accessibility. So going kind of above and beyond Texas ADA standards uh, wherever we can. And Peter spoke to one of the ways we achieve that. And you know, instead of having uh, switchback ramps and separate separate pathways that are accessible, um, making those kind of long uh, shared use accessible walkways as sort of the single main pathway and providing accessibility for everyone everywhere we can. So that goal carries throughout and you know it also relates to the stage as you mentioned. So there's two areas I would point out. One is the the back of the stage, the main park entrance where Peter was showing those photos of the stair. Uh, that is both a stair and a ramp. So one of the ways that you know as the stair kind of emerges from the ground, the section further south where there are no stairs, that is a direct connection to the sidewalk that is accessible. And then as the grade kind of moves down, it becomes a stair. So that's one of the design features that, you know, looks very cool as the stair kind of disappears, but it also provides both um, wheelchair um, and accessible an accessible entrance and a stair entrance in the same location. On the stage itself, which is, you know, lower down, um, it has stairs at the front. But one of the things we've done with the stair there is it has a ramp which cuts diagonally across through the stairs. So it's a little bit hidden when you look at it straight on, you can't see it but there's a ramp moving diagonally across the length of those stairs uh, that allows for accessibility to the stage during normal park use. So one of the ideas with the stage is during normal park use, um, you know, maybe we'll have seating up there and that'll be a place where people can occupy and enjoy uh, the shade and the rain protection on the stage. During a show, obviously that won't be accessible to the general public and we will cover up the ramp and the stair. But, you know, if performers, folks with access to the stage um, you know, need an accessible entrance that exists through the building, uh, which will be closed uh, to the public during normal park mode. So always kind of considering those multiple accessibility scenarios and providing uni universal accessibility wherever possible. Another uh, question we got um, from Heather is, um, will there be a plan to protect the beautiful amenity amenities from vandalism and to ensure the safety of park visitors? Well, absolutely to both. And, you know, we're developing those plans now. I would say the the biggest thing that, that we're doing is, uh, you know, we spoke to the design and construction of this park, but organizationally, we don't just pack up our bags and go away once that's done. Uh, our responsibility extends forever uh, in operations and maintenance of these amenities once they're built. 
So, you know, he's not here with us today, but we have a director of uh, park operations, um, Martin, who is putting together a team and a plan to manage these parks at a really high level. And that will include uh, daily staff on site um, at all park hours, as well as uh, nighttime security. Um, you know, we also have designed and continue to um, add in modifications, which help, uh, you know, prevent graffiti um, and make those operational considerations and, and impacts easier to manage. But, you know, big picture, it's really about staffing and activating these spaces with uh, personnel and programs as much as possible. So this will be a highly active, highly engaging space all days of the year. Um, and that's the number one way that we're really going to uh, help keep things uh, safe and, and free from graffiti. We should also add that um, we have great partners to help us in that effort. Um, Downtown Austin Alliance, um, you know, who is responsible for maintaining and operating Republic Square. Um, they're going to be our partner in operating and maintaining uh, Waterloo Park. And so um, you know, we've got, they've got great experience uh, on the ground already, um, in addition to our in-house staff. So um, we feel really good about how this is going to um, play out. Um, but it's also an area, I mean, just to be frank, this is, you know, one of the ways in which, um, you know, support for Waterloo Greenway is important um, is because that support will go directly to maintain and operate Waterloo Park going forward. Uh, we also got a question, uh, Peter, whenever you had a photo up, uh, it was an aerial, somebody asked what the building on the bottom left was. Um, Peter or John, would you mind just kind of giving a general overview of what the Waller Creek Tunnel in the facility um, is? Sure. Um, so yeah, there it is, bottom left, the building with the white roof. So uh, Waller Creek itself has a long history of very uh, impactful flood events, both on property and people, um, loss of life, millions of dollars of property damage, and really contributing to the degradation of the creek historically. So one of the first actions that the city took in order to improve the conditions on Waller Creek was to build a flood control tunnel. Um, and that flood control tunnel takes about 30 acres out of the 100 year floodplain. And it means that Waller Creek itself will no longer be exposed to these, you know, kind of traditional center, central Texas flash flood events that can be so damaging and costly. And the way that that tunnel works is through, uh, you know, the infrastructure that you can see here. So basically, the Waller Creek watershed, um, kind of all north of here, comes flowing down into the creek, and then it reaches this pond, which is the, you know, water you can see at the bottom of the screen there. And that pond helps slow the water down and collect it. And then from the pond, it enters um, through a series of screens and grates, which help grab debris. And um, there's a you know, great team at the Watershed Protection Department who manages uh, the capture and removal of that debris, which helps keep the tunnel, which this water flows down into underneath this building, that helps keep the tunnel free of debris and flowing. And that water flows underneath the city through a tunnel, and then it pushes the water out into the lake uh, down at the mouth of Waller Creek. Um, which helps keep Waller Creek free of these flash flood events and debris um, and allows us to build all of these park amenities. So the facility you see here is sort of above the tunnel, so where the, the water goes into the tunnel. Um, the area with the partial roof is where the debris is captured uh, and you know hauled off site. And then underneath the white roof are all the supporting facilities. So that includes the you know mechanicals for the tunnel and includes the mechanical equipment to support the debris grabbing uh, mechanisms, uh, storage spaces, and all the electrical utility spaces and offices that support the, the staff which is working there. And you can see the parking lot there too, which allows them to come in, load up trucks, haul things off site, um, and uh, keep, this, keep the tunnel clean and running. And I'll also add that, you know, in addition to the maintenance we just mentioned, one important part of keeping the park system beautiful um, and the creek, you know, fully functional um, is the tunnel operation. So throughout the months and years, you know, going forward, there will be also frequent operations to keep this tunnel uh, pond, tunnel itself, and all of the supporting infrastructure running properly and cleanly. So it will be a close partnership with the Watershed Protection Department working together to make sure um, all that, you know, works effectively and, and our parks and the, and the creek support each other. So, yeah, if it wasn't 
complex enough to build a uh, a new park with a new 5,000 person amphitheater in the middle of downtown Austin. It's also layered on top of this really complex and vital um, piece of stormwater management infrastructure. And so you have this kind of like layer cake of all these different systems that are um, superimposed and integrated um, with one another. And again, that's one area where I just give the design team a shout out because I think they figured out how to do that in a really beautiful, seamless way. But it also is is part of the story, right? Part of the story here is that you know these um, these park spaces provide not just amenities for the public, but um, there's also embedded in them you know infrastructure that makes our city function at its sort of most fundamental level. Yeah, definitely. I also wanted to add. Um, Last year we did a um, Waller Creek Tunnel tour, so you can actually learn more about the inlet facility um, on our YouTube channel and on our website too. Um, let's see, our last uh, questions for this tour, um, we had a couple questions about uh, the future phasing of Waterloo Greenway. Um, if y'all can just speak a little bit about what's coming up next and yeah. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, so I'm gonna yeah. go to the phasing map for a second. All right. Great. Right. So this is, you know, this is just phase one, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, of a multi-phase project to realize the vision of the Greenway. And so the entire Greenway is roughly 35 acres of new and restored public open space, which is kind of highlighted here in all the areas you see in green in the map that Peter just pulled up. And phase one is, is the orange area. So kind of phase zero, which was Symphony Square for anyone who's, who's been to any of the events we hosted there in the pre-COVID days, that was kind of our initial phase where we got office and built a public space uh, or restored a, a great existing public space. And then phase one is Waterloo Park on the Moody Amphitheater. So our next phase, which is uh, under design now and, and will hopefully be uh, in construction by the end of the year uh, is what we call Creek Delta, which are the areas you see in kind of that gold yellow color on the left. So basically from 4th Street to the lake, um, we will be uh, you know, restoring and improving uh, the creek and then building a system of accessible trails uh, connecting from 4th Street and you know, the rail station and convention center and everything happening there all the way down to the lake and Butler Trail and all the great work the Trail Foundation is doing. And also stitching together east and west um, through a series of bridges. So it's a lot about connectivity and ecology in a kind of very narrow um, section of the creek. And the creek itself is very beautiful down there. Um, so a lot to work with. That's the next phase. And then after that, we'll kind of bring things together in the middle um, and including the restoration of Palm Park, which you see there uh, in blue, kind of in the bottom left uh, next to Creek Delta. And you know, Palm Park is a really important existing park. And a lot of the design and development of that park will be in conjunction with the future of Palm School. So a lot of close coordination work uh, with the city and the county on the future of that site, but really those things will kind of move together. Um, and, you know, eventually we'll stitch this whole thing together and have a continuous ADA accessible network of trails and a fully restored creek, which connects, you know, the, the trail, um, you know, great cultural resources like the Mexican American Cultural Center, Palm Park, all the way up to Waterloo Park, um, safely and accessibly along a really beautiful uh, environmental feature that's the creek. We should also add, you know, the, the pontoon bridge or what we historically called the pontoon bridge, which is a, a new pedestrian bridge at the, kind of the southern end of the Waterloo Greenway Trail connecting to the, the south bank of the lake. Um, we expect that to be built uh, as part of the Project Connect plant. So as along with a um, you know, a, a transit connection across the, for the blue line across the lake, um, there will be a dedicated pedestrian and cycling uh, bridge across the lake in that location that then will connect uh, to the, the Waterloo Greenway Trail. Awesome, well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you, John. Um, is there anything else you all wanna add before um, I finish up with some closing statements? Uh, no, I just want to, other than, um, I'm just going to go to the final because it's the most important, the most important part, <laughs> which is thank you. Um, 
for those of you that have, uh, oh, for those of you that have um, supported our project in any way, right, um, through participating in a program or, um, you know, uh, like today or, or supporting us financially, just really um, thank you for being engaged in this project. This is how we're going to make this happen. Um, and that's how it's going to be meaningful to the city as broadly as possible. So thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, John. And um, I also just want to do a quick shout out uh, to our program sponsors, BBVA and the Powell Foundation. Um, another quick reminder is that to, uh, next week is uh, Amplify Austin Day. Um, it's coming up on March 4th and 5th. And this is your opportunity to help amplify future educational initiatives at Waterloo Greenway. And uh, with your support, we are hoping to raise $25,000 by next Friday. And um, all gifts will be matched dollar for dollar, for dollar up to $25,000 by the Tapestry Foundation, a generous supporter of literacy-based programs in Austin. Um, you can learn more about our educational initiatives and how to donate at waterloogreenway.org. Thank you all so much again, and uh, we hope to see you at our next virtual tour. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.